people of the internet, welcome to some code and beer. Cheers. Any memory that we allocate on the heap is filled with uh, pseudo-random data. And it is pseudo-random data that uh, varies from one test run to the next, but in a very controlled manner. So for each test, we have a seed number that is reported if the test fails. And using this seed number, we can exactly reproduce all this, this pseudo-random data that gets uh, put in the memory. Um, so we have a nice combination of a lot of MB being injected into our code for shaking out bugs. Also, we have full reprodu uh, reproducibility of results uh, that allow us to debug any bugs that could show up. And this was actually a very simple to implement. It's just Simple uh, pseudo random number generator that shows up the, the buffers that we allocate. So, very simple but very effective for detecting uses of uninitialized memory. Uh, second thing is completely done yet, but it's done enough that you can basically use it that is, uh, the injection of allocation faults in. Uh, the debug build and um, I will use this and I have already tried to use it uh, in the fast tests where we pump uh, invalid data into our code and, and check its robustness and on top of the invalid data we will also uh, be able to inject, inject uh, allocation faults where the, the memory allocator claims towards the user code that it was not able to um, allocate memory and the user code has to handle with has to handle it and has to deal with it gracefully and we can check in our fast testing if this is actually um, happening so very important for covering all the code paths that uh, are needed for handling allocation faults yeah, then I did some general cleanup. I also cleaned up the build system a bit and organized the build options more uh, cleanly. The listing files are now uh, put next to the objects. So if we have different uh, compilation options for source files that are built for different executable targets, they get different listing files. So that is clean and we cannot accidentally look at the wrong code that has been generated. Okay, so far for the infrastructure, but uh, then was the time to get back uh, to actually writing productive code that gets some things done. And so, so what I did is I, I wrote for the JBIG2 decoder that I'm working on, I wrote the decoding of generic bitmap regions. I wrote the decoding of the pattern dictionaries and of the halftone regions. And for all the three of them, it is um, only implemented so far using the MMR um, encoding option. And MMR is basically um, the group four fax, fax encoding of um, the CCITT group 4 fax encoding that I had already implemented. And now this can be used for uh, generic bitmap regions in JPEG2 files, for pattern dictionaries and for halftone regions. I will soon show you a picture that makes it a bit clearer to you what, what this all means. But these things are working now for the MMR encoding option. And the crucial thing today will be that there is a second very different encoding options that we will start to implement today that is arithmetic coding and we will talk a bit about that and start to start to implement the arithmetic decoding options 
So let me see how far the tests are. Tests are all green. And now I can finally show you the output of our most interesting tests so far. This is a test that goes through an example from the JBIC2 uh, standard. So in the standard they included a complete, uh, complete sample data stream that encodes several pages and the first page looks roughly like this. So I, I just print the bitmap here in, in using ST characters. And if we compare to the reference from the standard, we see that it is exactly the same bitmap. It's just the aspect ratio is a bit different uh, due to the font. But it's exactly bit for bit the same bitmap. And this is a huge milestone for me because you wouldn't believe how many different techniques they use to encode this bitmap. So this bitmap has, it contains a generic bitmap region. That is basically the simplest thing where you have a CCITT group 4 encoded bitmap. That is actually the the frame that you see here is encoded in this way. So this is put on the page using generic region encoding. Uh, the second thing is a, a text section that makes up these letters here. These letters come from symbol dictionaries that are themselves um, encoded using MMR encoding. And then these symbols are placed like little sprites uh, according to a Huffman coded description of the text section and so on. So um, if you followed the stream before, you might have seen a lot of stuff about Huffman decoding and that was uh, mostly for these text se section stuff and f um, yeah, mostly for the text section, section stuff. Then there is another kind of region and that is called a halftone region. Um, this is the, the inside of, of this frame here is the halftone region. And a halftone region has the purpose of efficiently <coughs> encoding scanned halftone prints. A halftone print is what you see, for example, in, in the newspapers when they uh, print black and white um, pictures by putting little dots through a screen and where the dots are denser the image is darker and where the dots are <clears throat> less dense the image is lighter and JBIC2 has um, JBIC2 has mechanisms that uh, target exactly those regions on scanned pages where you have these halftone pictures because they compress poorly in other uh, using other methods and the idea is here that you have a, a grid, a regular grid of little pattern cells and the pattern cells themselves come from a pattern dictionary. So you again have these kind of little sprites, but organized differently than in a symbol dictionary. And these little sprites are put uh, in a grid, but it's completely crazy because this grid does not have to be axis aligned. So this grid could be oblique somehow. And it only fixes the, the positions of the patterns that you put. The patterns themselves are axis aligned, but this grid that uh, tells you where to put them is not. And a grayscale image is encoded that actually tells you which pattern to put at which grid point. And this grayscale image is encoded in separate bit planes and the bit planes again are a gray code encoding of the actual uh, lightness values of, of this halftone grid. So it's completely crazy. Um, <clears throat> and all of this works right now in my JBIC2 decoder in, in the basic version using the MMR decoding and no arithmetic uh, decoding. Okay, that's it so far.
now comes the big, <clears throat> um, the big challenge. The JBIG2 standard defines almost everything that it, that it can do in two, vari in two variants. Uh, one variant is using the Huffman coding and the MMR coding. Uh, that is kind of the old-fashioned method that comes from the CCITT fax uh, encoding and um, old-school Huffman coding techniques. And then there is, for almost everything in the standard, there is a second alternative and that is arithmetic coding. And so you basically have, have to implement the standard twice almost. It's really annoying for the implementer that they did not decide on one of these versions. They say in the standard, well, uh, it's kind of a trade-off because the Huffman and MMR stuff is faster but gives less compression and the arithmetic decoding is uh, slower and gives better compression. And the, this arithmetic coding stuff is really quite complicated, also partly interesting, but also complicated and you will see that there are really huge challenges for making this at least reasonably fast. It's not so much the arithmetic decoding itself, I think, but it's then uh, the context in, in which the arithmetic decoding is, is used uh, in JBIG2 that makes this very difficult. But first, uh, first we must be able to do some arithmetic decoding at all. And I don't know if you have experience with arithmetic coding. So for me, this is a new topic that I'm just uh, going into as, as we speak. So I, I read a bit in the standard about it, but, but that's about it. Um, and it is a completely different idea from Huffman coding. And so I think it will be nice to, to first talk a bit about um, what is the difference between Huffman coding and arithmetic coding and why might the latter one uh, be better in, in um, some circumstances. So let's first um, sketch an example of <clears throat> Huffman coding and we always want to encode some kind of abstract symbols. These symbols could be uh, integers, they could also be characters or, or anything else really that uh, can be put in a list. And let me use letters for demonstration. So let's say we want to encode a string that can contain letters A, B, and C. These are our symbols. So we have these symbols that we that we need to encode. So first we, we, we will look at it from the point of view of the encoder. And each, each symbol gets a code word that is a string of bits. And let's say we encode A as a zero bit and we encode B as a one zero combination and C as a one one combination. So this would be a typical Huffman encoding for the case that A is the most frequent symbol and B and C are less frequent. And <clears throat> So building such a Huffman code table is, is quite easy, which I already explained in a, in a previous stream how you do it. And it gives a quite efficient encoding. However, it, the, the method has severe limits. And the most significant limit is the following, that uh, every symbol has to use an integer number of bits. So, for example, you see that A uses one bit, uh, B uses two bits, C uses two bits. There is no symbol that uses one and a half bits, for example. And what this mean, what, what one and a half bits means 
uh, we will uh, explain uh, later. But you could imagine that, uh, so, so the perfect number of bits to use for a symbol depends on the probability of the symbol. And we are currently, we are, we are looking at encodings that encode symbols independently from, from each other. So the Huffman coding decodes each symbol independently of the others. And it looks at the probabilities and chooses the encoding length. But it's, it is limited because it can only choose integer encoding length. And so you can imagine since probabilities are, um, are not quantized quantities, or probabilities are always continuous quantities in a range from 0 to 1. So 0 to 100% can be anything in between. You can imagine that the, the perfect length for a symbol A would be, for example, 1.5 bits. And the Huffman encoding cannot realize this. It has to make a compromise and uh, by making the compromise between 1 and 2 bits, uh, it will lose some, some encoding efficiency. And arithmetic encoding is a technique that addresses this problem. <clears throat> And the name is really the clue here because it, it is called arithmetic because it has something, something to do with numbers um, in the sense of numbers as, as they are used in mathematics. Let's start like this. Uh, in the end, if you encode anything, you get a bit stream. The bit stream is just a sequence of zeros and ones. So let's say it is 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. And arithmetic encoding uh, rests on a very simple idea that you can interpret a bit string of arbitrary length as a number, as a fractional number, by simply placing a binary point at the beginning. So it interprets this number as 0 0.0110011010. And so any, any arbitrary length bit stream can be interpreted as a rational number in the interval between, uh, so it's, it's a number in the interval from zero to one, where, where zero is inclusive. If you have all zeros and one is, you cannot quite reach, so one is, is exclusive. <clears throat> so, um, that, that is the most crucial idea. It does not yet explain how the coding works, but um, it's important that you can interpret a bit stream as a rational ratio number in the interval between zero and one. So, to say it, um, to say it in a different direction, if somebody gives you inside the interval from 0 to, to 1, if someone gives you an exact point in this interval somehow, you can um, translate it back to a bit stream. <clears throat> and you would do it in the following way. So, which, which bit stream does this, this number here on the, in, the, in the interval uh, correspond to? You do it in the following way. So, let me pick another color. Uh, the crucial point is that you divide the interval in half. So, here you would have the point one half. And then you check, is is the point you got, is it to the, to the right or to the left of the division? And if it is uh, to the right, you put a 1 in your number. And if it is to the left, you would put a 0. 
then you do the, the, the same thing again, but this time only with this with the with the part of the interval in which the point um, is located. So again you divide this. In this case you would divide it at three fourths. And again you ask is the point in the lower or higher half? In this case it is in lower half so you, so you write a zero. And you continue with this part of the interval. So you divide again. So now I already have to think what is the dividing point. It has to be something with eighths. So this is six eighths, so it should be five eight. Five over eight. And in this case it is in the upper half, so you put a one. And so on. So an, an exact point uh, corresponds an exact point corresponds to a bit stream. <clears throat> now mathematically, if you really have an exact real number, it could even uh, correspond to an infinite bit stream. But in here in, in, in uh, computer science, we always have uh, some, some limited uh, memory and we will only be interested in a finite precision. So uh, this bit stream will be finite because at one point we will say, okay, now, now it's accurate enough. We have accurate enough information where this point lies. Now comes the second crucial idea because so far what we did, we had the interval from zero to one and we divided it always in half. So here, here, here and so on. Uh, the crucial idea is now that actually nobody forces us to always divide it in half. We could have a, a different strategy for dividing the interval and as long as the sender and the receiver of the bit stream have the same strategy for dividing, they will end up with the same point in the interval. Welcome back. Once again we learned that software is terrible. That is what happens when people who do not know how to write software write USB drivers for our devices and things like that. <clears throat> My computer crashed so hard that, it, that I couldn't even shut it down. And I have no idea why. So my first suspicion would be the USB driver of the streaming camera. So people do not write crappy software. That's why I make this stream to tell people how to write software that is not a, not a heap of crap. The advantage that arithmetic encoding uh, has over, over Huffman coding is that Huffman coding is limited in that it must use an integer number of bits for every, every symbol. And if, for example, the optimal number of bits for a particular symbol A, let's say, would be 1.5 bits, Huffman coding cannot realize this and it has to compromise and so it uh, loses uh, encoding efficiency. And arithmetic encoding is a technique that does not have this, this problem and uh, therefore uh, can theoretically uh, and also in, in practice uh, under certain circumstances, circumstances uh, reach a better encoding efficiency, better compression. And the basic idea is just that any bit stream can be interpreted uh, as a number. And I briefly explained how the normal, the normal encoding that you have in, in mathematics, if you have a number in a base two, for example, the normal encoding is that with every, every, di every digit after the fractional point, you, you half the interval and 
the crucial insight that is behind arithmetic coding is that it's nothing forces you to exactly half the interval each time. If both the sender and the receiver of a number agree on the same scheme for dividing the interval repeatedly, they can use any scheme they, wa they want at, as long as they use the same, the same uh, dividing uh, scheme for the interval. We made the crucial observation that for, for example for this scheme where we always divide in, in two-thirds and one-third that the interval does not shrink with the, with the same speed um, for ones and zeros. Uh, it, it turned out that whenever we encode a one that in, in our scheme here corresponds to the upper interval for the, to the upper uh, sub interval that is um, that has length one third then the interval shrinks more rapidly and if we encode a, a zero the interval does not shrink so rapidly because we have still two thirds left of the original interval and this is crucial because the smaller the intervals get uh, the more precision precision you need to specify a number that is certainly within the interval. If the interval is still quite wide, then you will not need a lot of bits to specify a number in the traditional way that is certainly within the interval. And the smaller the interval gets, the more, um, the more uh, digits you will need to specify a number that certainly is in the interval. And this translate, translates in the end into the following that uh, choices that shrink the interval rapidly uh, require a lot of encoded uh, digits in the end and choices that do not uh, shrink the interval so rapidly or decisions because it's in the standard it's then also called a decision we, so at, at every step we have a binary decision do we go left or right and one of those decisions will typically shrink the interval more than the other one and the one that shrinks the interval more so that shrinks the interval more rapidly this decision will require more bits in the end to uh, to tell to the, the receiver where we are um, on the interval. Uh, we, we do not need to spend an integer number of encoded bits per decision. We can have the case, for example, that one decision uh, requires on average 1.5 bits to be added to the encoded stream. We are not uh, restricted like the Huffman coding to uh, encode each decision, which in the case of Huffman coding is which symbol to pick, to encode each decision with an integer number of bits. This restriction is um, simply not there with arithmetic coding. To summarize, the, the, basic, the basis of arithmetic coding is interval subdivision. We have an interval that starts out from 0 to 1 and we divide it further and further. And at each step we have two choices. And these choices, let's introduce names for them that will be used also in the, in the standard we are working on. So you have at each step you have two choices. They are called the MPS, which is the more probable symbol, and the LPS, which is the less probable symbol. So the MPS gets the larger interval and the LPS gets the smaller interval. Whether you put the MPS left or right is uh, it's just a convention and I think we will see in the standard, I think they do it, I'm not sure now if they do it differently, but they can, you can do it the other way around. It's just the important thing is, is that the MPS has the larger part of the interval. So if you restrict to this part of the interval, you need to add fewer, fewer binary digits to your encoded number in order to hit this interval with certainty. An important question is, of course, 
how much more probable is the more probable symbol. And that is something that the encoder will have to estimate and it will, an adaptive encoder will continuously update its estimate uh, about the more probable symbol is. And it can even change about whether the more probable symbol is actually the one or the zero. Uh, the, the zero or the one in the input stream. So this can, can be switched. Uh, and we will need to implement the same adaptive algorithm in the decoder because, as I said, the encoder and decoder must always agree on the subdivision scheme for the interval. And if this is an adaptive scheme that depends on the data, then also this adaptive scheme must be implemented on both sides. Here we get to a, another point that might be interesting. There's one appendix that uh, describes this arithmetic coding. It's quite complicated. And there we have a kind of state machine table. Uh, and this state machine table probability estimation. So it, it will start out at a quite neutral probability estimate about at about 50% chance for either symbol. And from there it will evolve depending on, on the incoming uh, data. And uh, the estimates will, will shift in a prescribed manner. And we will need to implement this uh, probability estimation process also in the decoder. So we know uh, the interval division that the encoder used for creating the bit stream that we are looking at. And I, for getting a better understanding about what this, what this state machine is about, I imported this data into Mathematica and we should be able to look at some pretty pictures. The first plot we look at is the states are on the x-axis and the estimated probability, in, in this case is actually the probability for the least, for the less probable symbol is on the y-axis. And we start out with about 50-50 chance for both symbols. And then we see an inter interesting thing that we have here three falling curves. And the first one falls very rapidly, the second one less rapidly, and the third one least rapidly. But it's also the longest one. And it works as follows. We start out with the first state and if the prediction that the probability estimator makes is correct, the probability for the least, so correct means that the, actually the most, the more probable symbol occurs in the input data. And if this happens, the probability estimate for the less probable symbol will decrease very rapidly. So if it predicts correctly one time, uh, it will estimate that the less probable symbol occurs only every third time approximately. If it is right again, it will estimate that actually the, the less probable symbol only occurs, let's say, less than every fifth time, maybe every, every sixth or seventh time, or even eighth, I think it's eighth time about and so on. So every time it is right, it will feel uh, confirmed in its belief and will very rapidly decrease its estimate for the uh, likelihood of the least probable, uh, the less probable symbol. And this will actually then jump, jump to the tail of this um, curve on the right to go to very, very low probability values. But what happens if the prediction is wrong? And there we have this uh, succession of, of these 
three different curves. So if we are on the first curve, curve and we predict wrongly, this will e eject us from the first curve into the second one, which is a bit more skeptical. So you see that the second curve does not drop so rapidly because the, the thinking is, okay, we were already uh, wrong once. So maybe we should not be so optimistic about our predictions and we will reduce the probability more slowly, the probability estimate of the less probable symbol. And if we are wrong again, we are ejected again to the third curve that, um, that decreases even more slowly. But if we then uh, are right more often, we will move down this curve and we can also get to very low probability estimates. And the second plot I made is where we look at the transition matrix of this state machine. And we see here the following things. So the light brown is the diagonal that would be we remain in the same state. This can happen in some, in some cases, but it's not the typical case. Uh, blue means we made a correct prediction and you see that uh, blue will typically just increment the state, the, the state value. That means when we are right, we will move down this curve to higher numbered states which correspond to lower probabilities for the uh, less probable uh, symbol. Uh, looks like a S curve. Um, um, maybe you you mean this curve? It I mean it. It has the pro it has the um, it has the property that at the beginning it does not uh, fall so quickly. Then it falls more quickly, and then again it um, becomes less quickly. But um, I still think that these are, so the tail I think is roughly an exponentially falling function, but the beginning is, is more damped. So the beginning is not so, not falling so quickly. So I, I think the first one is, is roughly exponential and the other ones, they are, yeah, they are somehow S shaped. <clears throat> and so, so if you look at the transitions, uh, being right usually just moves us further down the state machine uh, to smaller and smaller probabilities. There are actually some jumps, but they are just mean that we, from the first part of the curve, we can jump to the tail of the, of the last one. So when we are here and we are right, we jump somewhere to the tail here where we get the even lower probabilities. And, and similarly here from the second, if we are right throughout the second curve, we also jump to the tail of the third curve. So no surprises here. The interesting part is if we are wrong. So if we are wrong in the first part that corresponds to, to this quickly falling curve, then we are the, the orange shows where we are ejected to the second part. So it goes like this, horizontal like this, and then vertical like this, and we would be in the second part. So these are all points that eject us to a more skeptical curve, so to say. And then we see in the, in the last part, in the, in the slowly falling long curve, that's a bit different because there is no fourth curve that we could move to. The only thing that happens if we are wrong here, we move up again to higher probability estimates. And if we are then right again, we move down. So this is, this is then a smooth adaptation where we move up and down this curve. We have no escape possibility from here. So once we are in the third, in the third curve, we cannot get back to the first and the second one. So, so once we are sliding up, down and here, that's it. We cannot get back to these uh, more, let's say, ambitious curves. We will just move up and down these, as you said, uh, slightly S-shaped curve. 
So that's something we will need to implement according to this uh, table in the, in the standard. Uh, what you will also notice that we have um, some points where we have this flag called switch set to true. And these are exactly the peaks of the curves where we have about um, neutral probability estimate because there we switch between what we believe to be the more probable symbol. So if we are already at neutral and then a symbol comes in, then we say, okay, this is probably the, the, actually the more probable symbol. So this, um, this switching behavior will, will also be something that we need to <clears throat> take care of. There's actually something like a miniature fourth curve that is a, a singleton state that only moves to itself. So it's a final trap, but there's actually no state moving to this state. So I don't know exactly what it is for. You, you would really have to initialize the state machine in this state and then you remain at the fixed neutral probability. So we see here the the last square here, the last state has nowhere to go and it is trapped at, at the neutral probability estimate. So there may be there may be some special marker that moves us to the state. I, I'm not yet sure. Of course, if we are at neutral and, and remain there, it basically means that we have a direct encoding of zeros and ones into our bit stream because both are equally likely and so we have just um, either one-to-one -one encoding or exactly the, the negated encoding depending on, on where we are in our switch state. But, but it means that at this permanent neutral state uh, the, most, the more and the less probable symbol will uh, use the same number of bits. Okay. Um, I hope that was a useful explanation. Um, I will now move to the to the coding. And as I said, I, it's the first time for me to implement an arithmetic coding. So probably the first version I will do will be very stupid and very slow. But it should be functional and should be good enough for me to understand how we could maybe get a better version that would be faster and so on. So unless you have any any specific questions about this this uh, theoretical background, we will move to actual code. Cheers. The one thing I'm not exactly sure is where is the best way to start. I think I want to get my example or my, my actually my unit test that tests the example that is uh, given in the standard. I want to expand this uh, to the point where I get to to do some arithmetic coding. So what I have so far is it goes up to the seventh segment up to the seventh segment, everything is Huffman and MMR decoded. And this is where I get this, um, this bitmap that I showed you before. So this bitmap that is exactly what is given in the standard as an example is decoded by this code. And now, so this is the first page of the example JBIG stream that we are working with. The second page actually has exactly the same content, but implemented using arithmetic coding. So that's what we will start with now. So let's look at what the eighth segment brings us. 18th segment, oh, there are so many segments. 10th, 7th, this is what we did, this is the half, the this I did off stream. The eighth segment header, this is the end of page. I think I have this actually already. 
six, seven. Ah, I did not update the comment. This is actually the eight. This is the end of page. This is already done. So here we have actually the ninth segment. And the ninth segment, okay, this is page information. This should go quickly. Page information is simple. We can copy this. So we expect this to be um, segment number eight for page number two. Okay, they claim it, it contains the same information as number one. But that's good because then we don't need to change the code. Page information, blah, blah, blah. The same size. But I think it will be page number two, right? Should be page number two. Let's see. Yeah, it's page number two and has a length of 90 bytes. So that's the only difference that is not for page one, but for page two. Everything else should be the same. Um, we free here the page bitmap. We will create a new one for ourselves and we will also free it at the end. So we will print it and free it at the end. This is something we can all um, we can already put here. This will only print an empty bitmap so far. So let's go to the 10th segment. This is where it will start to become interesting. The 10th segment is a symbol dictionary and this will be encoded uh, using arithmetic coding. So here it will start to become difficult. For the Symbol dictionary, we already also have a template because one of the first segments here is a symbol dictionary. Actually, the is actually the first one. So let us copy this. <clears throat> so in, in unit tests, I'm, I'm much more relaxed about copying a lot of code. In, in productive code, I would never accept this kind of, of duplication that we have here. But in unit tests, it's something different because simplicity and explicitness is even more important than in, in the productive code. Um, header number should be nine, page number should be two, uh, length should be 27, it should reference no other segments, it should be a symbol dictionary, does not have this, is retained, yeah this is always similar to the first one, so we parse the header. Okay, and here we have a difference because for the first segment, we got here the information that it does use Huffman coding. Now we expect this information to be false, so it should not use Huffman coding. It does not use refinement, that's the same. Refinement is a whole other story that we will need to implement later. Um, the Huffman table selection is actually not meaningful here now. SD template is 
too. So let's see what which which members we already have in our SD header. So symbol dictionary header. So these should both be false I read in the example. Bit more context used and bit more content content retained should should be false. Uh, what else do we have? We have the SD template selection. And I should actually start to put the expected value to the left because that's, I think, actually what, what Google test suggests. <clears throat> so SD template selection should be two. And now the SDAT flex, yeah, that's a funny thing that we will, that we will talk about later. What, what these flags are. So the ATX one is two. As the header, as the AT flags should be zero dot X. And then we have minus one, I think, in the Y. Yeah. Two minus one. So then we have two exported symbols and two new symbols. So let's allocate a symbol dictionary. This is actually the third one we allocate. And let's parse it. And this will be the interesting step. Um, and this we will remove because this will be different now. I think this we could, we could leave. Okay, so let's now see how far we come. We of course expect a fail because we will be running into code paths that are not yet implemented. First we have of course our usual syntax errors that I always make. Okay, the, we do not redefine this here. Yeah, again course we don't want to redefine it and the segment header will be the next one that it explain, uh, complains about. That comes from the stupid copy and past, paste. Um, and another one. But now we should be in better shape. Sometimes Visual Studio is taking forever before it compiles the first file. I don't, I have no idea what it is doing. It says building CMake project, but it's not doing anything for tens of seconds. People do not write software like this. completely absurd. What does what is it doing? <laughs> now I did something finally. So where do we fail? Uh, usual test runs. Yeah, and then we run into an assertion because the code path is missing. At line 5024 that that was expected.
So, 5,024. We expect here that we use Huffman coding. So if we don't use Huffman coding, we get into the interesting arithmetic coding stuff, sorry. So here we will start to play with things. So let's first uh, put an assert force here at the end because uh, this everything that we, sorry, I'm typing so badly. Everything that we do will be incomplete here. Let's just see how far we can get. Okay, we have We have only a few bytes to decode, but this will be quite a challenge still. And it should give us the figures H for A. So how should they look? Figure H for Okay, so we should get a C and an A with exactly these pixels when we correctly decode the stuff. And, and further information about how to decode this, we can find actually in the... Um, symbol dictionary decoding procedure. This should be the one. And this is one of these things that has completely different code paths for Huffman, on one, Huffman coding on one side and arithmetic coding on the other side. Then there's actually even a third one, the refinement coding, but that's, that's, that uses the arithmetic one, I think. Okay. Create the array of bitmaps. This is something that we will not do right now. Okay, the hate, hate class. Um, so the hate classes are actually handled in the same way. So we can reuse some of the code here. So we can move this down. The hate class stuff we need. Uh, this we also need. This also. So that should all be the same hate class. Code the hate class delta hate. Oh, but the, but the coding of this will already be different, I think. So I think here will the, here the difference will start because for the Huffman decoding we use our generic Huffman decoding function that uses this specified table. And we will now do something different. We need to decode the hate class delta hate as in 656. So let's go to 656. Uh, decode a value using the IHDH integer arithmetic decoding procedure. So you see we are getting close to the arithmetic decoding, but The problem is that the integer arithmetic decoding is still one layer above the arithmetic decoding because arithmetic decoding gives you binary decisions. So um, MPS and LPS, or you can also call it zero and one if you know what each is. 
it gives you a single bit each time. <clears throat> and in the standard for the JPEG2 format, they put on top of this arithmetic decoding, they put the integer arithmetic decoding that uses the arithmetic decoding to build up uh, integers. So we need to go to annex A. Um, C, B. Yeah, this is this. Um, and so this explains how you decode an integer in the end by decoding s single bits. So you first decode a sign bit. So that is the first thing we actually must do is decode a sign bit. And then you decode value bits and you uh, you decide what to do based on them. So first we need to decode the sign bit. And what they say to us is which context we want to use. And the idea is the following, that this probability estimate that we talked about earlier, um, this probability estimate is per context. So you have a, a list of, um, of possible um, contexts and for every context, you keep a separate probability estimate what the next uh, bit will be. And what they tell us here is um, to use the context i h d h um, 1 actually, because previous we is set to 1, so we because now we decode the first bit and we actually will pretend that the previous bit um, was one. Okay, actually the rightmost nine bits of previous are used. So actually we have here one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. We have nine bits. So this is the context identifier. <clears throat> um, first, we will not really do separate contexts. We will just work pretending that we will just pretend that we work in a certain context and we we'll just get things started and then we will move to, to having different contexts. So you see that nine bits are needed for this, for this IHDH decoding procedure. So uh, for this alone, we need 512 different contexts just for decoding the delta height of the height classes. And this is one of the 512 is, is this one that has the previous information that all the previous bits were zero except the last one, which was one. So that's at least how I understand this stuff. Um, and now, now we must actually go to the actual arithmetic decoding to get the first bit that we need. So this is in Annex E. First we describe the encoder, which we do not have to implement. We just need to understand it roughly because this is what 
produces the bitstream we are now trying to decode. So, um, yeah, this is the state machine we talked about. Yeah, there is also an important topic called bit stuffing that we did not yet talk about. We will come to that. So, arithmetic decoding. Uh, we will need some initialization. Um, it starts here, I think. Yeah, the decoder first it initializes its, its state. That is the first thing we need to do. Ah, this is so complicated. But the initialization, I think, is not so bad. So BP is a byte pointer. That's where we get our input. And then we have a register C that gets the first byte shifted left by 16. Okay, this is something we can do. So we will have a... This will be our register C, or maybe we should use uppercase C like in the standard. Usually I wouldn't use single case, uh, single letter identifiers, but in such a case, if there's a standard that describes an algorithm and uses these letters, then I think it's fine to use the same letters to minimize confusion for, for readers. <clears throat> um, so this actually, do we already have a bit source? Yeah, we already have a bit source. That is my way to get um, non byte aligned bits from the stream. So we actually need to get eight bits from the stream. And now actually we need to use the, the bit source. And we can, for example, just peek, peek at the, at the first eight bits and consume them. There's also a function where we could do it in one in one part, but maybe we should let's see how this code is. Extract u int um, msp first. And then we have a prefix of zero actually. So this does it in one in one core. So we get the first eight bits from the screen. And we shift them left by 16. Um, now we have to do the sub procedure byte in. So let's mark this as a command because we will probably refactor this later into a small inline function or something. So byte in. Um, B. Okay, so this asks now, is this byte, was this FF? So we actually should, we should actually first put the byte in, in a variable because we need to query it later. Actually, I think I don't need to cast here because this is already, but here I need a cast to the wider type. So, if b is this special magic value ff, then, then we need to do a lot of stuff. Then we need to peek at the next 
byte. Here we will uh, do the peak, which means uh, just look at the bytes without consume uh, at the bits without consuming them yet. If this is larger than 8f, so if b1 is larger than 8f, we have one case, otherwise we have the other. So if it is larger, we modify our C register. And we set the bit counter to 8. So CT is our bit counter. Um, I will actually use a longer name for that to make it a bit more descriptive. I think it's the number of available bits. Something like that. So now the number of available bits is 8. In the other case, we go, okay, in the other case we consume a byte. So let's consume a byte because they say increase the byte counter and B is always the one that BP points to. This is a bit strange how they describe it, but that's what they mean. So B now is that what used to be B1. We can actually assert that to make sure that we understand what is going on. Actually, we could make this simpler. We could simply consume 8 bits using the shift function of the data source. and say just b equals b1. So we um, say consume the next byte, the next input byte. And now we have, this is the bit stuffing case where we actually have, I don't fully understand this case yet, but bit stuffing is, pro, is basically the idea that the, the encoder had to insert some extra bits that are not actually part of the data to be encoded. And there are reasons why the encoder has to do this sometimes. And this has to be compensated in the decoder, basically by, by swallowing a bit. And this is, I think, the reason why we set here the, the bit counter to seven instead of eight, because we kind of swallow one of the bits that have been stuffed into the data stream by the encoder. So we must be very careful every time we shift B because B is a uint8 type, which I'm not sure if I should keep that because it really invites, invites mistakes here. just need to be aware that we always must cast this if we want to shift. Okay, that is the um, consume the next input byte. I don't, yeah. Once I understand this better, I will write a comment here about what is going on with the bit stuffing here. So if it, 
that was if it is at most 8f if it is larger than 8f that means we have actually reached reached a marker byte and we feed we feed all ones um, into the decoder um, this is at the end of the data stream um, we know the next byte is a marker byte we don't consume it we don't consume it so we will actually be stuck on this byte and we just feed all ones into the decoder actually we should say eight one bits into the decoder this is this case okay that means we have completely coded the byte in so let's let's mark this here with byte in and this will later be refactored into a function i guess okay now we have to do another shift we consume seven bits with this shift and we set our famous a register to this interesting value so a is a 16 bit register actually we use it here for the first time so we can declare it here so it does not hang around uninitialized yeah this a register this is another thing that i i should explain a bit i will explain it very briefly um, in our discussions about the arithmetic coding uh, we were discussing a kind of perfect mathematical case where everything is um, everything is precise for example the interval is always really an interval from zero to exactly one where well, one would be exclusive but the, the length of the interval would be exactly one and we 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 have no um, no inaccuracies no rounding errors nothing uh, the actual encoder and also the decoder do not work with an interval that is always fixed to be exactly one or one of his exact subdivisions um, it has a certain tolerance zone so the interval uh, the interval can be from 0.75 to 1.5 in length and this um, I think this corresponds to 0.75 that's the initial length of the interval and the, uh, the algorithm will take care to always keep this interval in this in this range between 0.75 and 1.5 and whenever the interval gets shorter than 0.75 I think it can never get larger by, by, by the working of the interval it can never get larger because it's an interval subdivision algorithm but it can get shorter than 0.75 so a can get smaller than this 8000 hex which as you know is exactly the midpoint of the 16-bit hex range if it gets smaller than that uh, then we will double everything that, that is called the renormalization and is one of the very important steps of this algorithm because the, the theoretical algorithm is something that works with infinite precision but we don't have these infinite precision numbers on, on the computer so we only can ever look at a certain window of, of digits and 
uh, we will we do kind of a floating point thing that we shift this window and by shifting this window that we look at farther to the uh, to the right so um, to to smaller and smaller significant digits um, or le less and less significant digits is the same as shifting what is within the window to the left by one bit and this this is something that we will do in the algorithm but first we start out with a at its lowest total length or, the, or let's say the, the smallest allowed interval length <coughs> So we are done with initing, initializing the decoder. So let's scroll past these horrible flow diagrams. So now we need to read, read the context. Okay, this is something I think we will fully deal with later because this should give us the, the probability estimate and, and everything. But let's, we will find out what we need here by going to the next step, um, the actual decoding. Now we will decode our first, our first bit. Um, the first thing we do is that we subtract something from A, namely the probability estimate uh, that corresponds to the state machine index. So uh, I think ICX is the state machine index, the state. So in our code, this will look like something like this. A is from A, we sub subtract the QE. indexed by the state, something like this. Um, the state is something we do not yet know how to initialize. Uh, this will be need to be initialized at the beginning based on the context. So the context will store the state. Um, at the beginning, I think the state will probably be the first one, so zero. This we will uh, check state initialization. And we will need a QA table, so QE table, or let's call it QE for state table or something. Um, and this will be one of the columns in this. This will be one of the columns in the in this table that I copied from the standard. Uh, this should be okay. I need to first import the data. Should be this table. Uh, we see what is important that all of these values are smaller than 8000 hex. That's important because otherwise we could get an overflow. So we can directly actually copy this stuff. And this will be our um, QE for state table. Okay, the copying, copying did not really work. Copy is input text. Um, yeah, why not? Let's just remove the quotes. Uh, 
And of course, we don't need those. This is something we will later move as well, so... One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, this is actually broken already at an interesting place. Because this is the 50%, um, then another 50%. There should be still another one, I think, right? So this is the first curve. That's the second curve. Ah, here. Here starts the third curve. So let's maybe format it like this to make this more visible. One, two, three, and then the fourth, the lone state at the end. <clears throat> How many do we want here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And let's make it eight in a row. So you see here we get to the smallest probability that is just the smallest notch above zero. Because, I mean, of course, we can never estimate the probability of zero because then we wouldn't know what to do if it actually happens. So, yeah. First step. So we have this step. See? Okay, okay, we need this value again, so let's actually load it into a register. This is actually the probability estimate for the LPS. Let's call it LPS probability estimate. And now if C high, that's the upper 16 bits of C, if this is smaller than the probability estimate. That's in our case just that. That's C high. If this is smaller than this estimate, we have one case as and the smaller means. I think the smaller means that the LPS, the LPS has been the, the less, the less probable symbol has been encoded. And this means the MPS.
So let's first do the <clears throat> the less probable symbol. This has its own flowchart. Oh wow! <laughs> now it goes on. Is this the same value? At least it's the same value we loaded already. So we need to check if a is actually smaller than that. Okay, here we may actually then make a state transition. Uh, this is actually something I don't know what... This we need to check how to initialize the... How to initialize the more probable symbol. I also don't know whether I should use boolean here for the single bits or u in one or whatever. I think a numeric type will be easier because we will in the end we will have to usually we will have to shift it into something I guess. We could even make it 32 because, I mean, we do not really gain something by making it. I mean, we hope that it will end up in a register anyway, so we don't really gain something by making it too small. Yeah, I also need to, this is also something that is stored in the context. What is the current more probable symbol? Um, we need to check the initialization there. But at least, yeah, we know that this is, and then we make a state transition. So state is NMPS. The NMPS is the next state that you go to if you have correctly predicted. So this is uh, the next state for the correct prediction. This is another one of these tables that we will need. So let's get this also from Mathematica as it is convenient. I mean you could just copy and paste this out of the standard also, but I think it will be more convenient here. So I already had it here, the MPS, that's column 5. This is this one. Let's copy this as plain text. Looks good. Now let's also, let's divide this into the same length as the one above here. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, that makes sense because the thirty-eight is the jump to the to the long tail. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 
So I will just parallel the, the layout. One, two, three, four, four. One, two, three. We made some mistake here. Yeah. I made a mistake. Because I did not really line up the values properly. Yeah, now, it, now it's correct. Now it is the same shape. Okay, that's our NMPS transition table. So this case is done. The other case, okay, we, uh, that's interesting. We actually give the same value to A in both cases. And that's funny, but first we need it for the comparison. So we cannot do it before the comparison. We could just copy it to, copy it to a different variable. So this is actually here we actually encode the LPS. I'm not really sure what about the comments to put because I don't yet fully understand the algorithm. One minus MPS, yeah, this is one minus MPS is just uh, the logical negation. Okay, and now we need to know if we have a switch. So we could either have another table for the switch But actually, you can also tell whether you switch, I think, by looking at the, at the probability estimate. It's just that there's one where you do not, do not switch, right? So it's these one, two, three that are at 50%, they switch, and the last one doesn't switch. So we could do without a table. So this is the case where switch i context is one and this is where it is zero. Wow, this algorithm is so complicated just for decoding a single bit. If we switch, yeah, okay, the switch is relatively straightforward. We just, switching just means MPS equals one minus MPS. That's straightforward. In the no switch case, we do not need to do anything. And then we actually make the other transition. Uh, 
we now make the wrong prediction. This is actually yeah, this is actually not right here because here we are, we have actually an MPS. Here we have the LPS. Yeah, if if we were wrong and we are at the fifty percent point, then we switch. That makes sense. At the non, let's say at the non-terminal neutral um, probability estimate state, then switch. Uh, and about the more probable symbol. That starts to make sense. So now we need a second table here for the for the wrong prediction case. Uh, this is data. Uh, this is the sixth column. So let's again, this time being a bit more careful. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six. It's already wrong, I think. Six, eight, yeah. Yeah, we see that, uh, for example, we see immediately that the last state has in both cases the same consequence. So that's a final trap. I do not get anywhere else. Here we walk up backwards until 14 and at 14 we are stuck. I mean, we are not stuck, we can walk back down again, again but we hit a wall so we cannot, from 14 we cannot never get to lower states. <clears throat> That's interesting that we have here also high numbers. So we climb them up the tail. Interesting. Yeah, whatever. That is our state transition table for the second case. So this LPS exchange is implemented. But then we all, always need to do a renorm. Uh, so let us that is the LPS exchange section of the now we have the renorm D 
empty. Beginning is easy, so we say if we have still if we have no no bits available, then we do a byte in. Okay, and now is the point where we need to refactor this byte in into a function. Okay, I will make a uh, three minute break or so and then I'll be back to I will be back to refactor this into a function, which will also mean we need to refactor the state probably into some kind of struct that we do we want it in a struct? Yeah, I mean, a struct is okay probably as long as the optimizer can um, can notice that it doesn't escape or isn't aliased, so it can put the values in registers nevertheless. Hmm. Yeah, we will check it out later. So, see you in a few minutes. Honestly, this is the most work I ever did for getting a single bit from a by, from from a date stream. <laughs> this is crazy. This is crazy. We need to refactor byte in. What do we need? Okay, there is a byte in this case, a byte that we have already consumed. <clears throat> so let's turn this into a function. Let's make a namespace arithmetic. Let's see. Uh, what we definitely need is what we need in almost every function. We need the status to data stream. Uh, we need uh, the bit source. That's just the usual stuff. What else do we need? The B1 is local, the C... Yeah, let's... Let's put things into a struct and let's later worry about the code generation. First, let's get things working and then we will see how, <clears throat> how the code turns out. So we have the B. Let's document this maybe a bit here. This is the latest input byte. 
this is the C register. This does not really have more explanation. And this is mostly self-documenting. Uh, here we will pass a pointer to decoder state. I call it decoder and not state because state is actually something I have below. So I'm not sure if I should actually call it decoder state. Maybe I should call it decoder registers. So let's put everything there and let's hope that uh, optimizing compiler will be smart enough to simplify all of that in the end. I mean this will be slow as hell anyway because there are so many decisions in the code and um, That is just how slow code usually looks. So that's the byte in. Let's use it. Oh, okay, this is this we actually have now. I uh, should also add a tick. We actually will use the namespace probably soon. I don't know. But it's also nice documentation. So, um, dates <coughs> and the uh, decoder. Then this is gone. So here we record uh, the byte in again. So arith arithmetic byte in. And that's what we wanted to do, right? Byte in. Okay, and then we do some easy shifts. That looks nice. So this is the renumeration where I mentioned we, we, we shift the window of bits that we are looking at. Uh, and this has the effect of the window contents being, so the window is shifted to the right, so the window contents relative to the window are shifted to the left. And we consume a bit in this way. Okay, and we need to do this long enough to bring to bring the length of the interval up into its tolerance range. So this is actually something that we will do in a loop. So do this while um, a and this is zero. So this is exactly what they say here. So as long as A has this bit cleared, we repeat. And then we are done and that is the end of renorm D, which probably will also become a function. I 
I think now we have this right branch with the LPS exchange and the renorm D. Now we need to do the, the left one. So this was the LPS exchange branch. The other one is MPS or MPS exchange. So first we sub subtract something from C high, uh, which is the same as subtracting a left shifted thing from C. should be the same. Okay, and then we also have this check if, if A is too small, let's say if it's not too small, Uh, so, <clears throat> A is still in the interval length A is still in the valid range. And here we need to renorm D again, which is probably a good reason to refactor this. Which also means we will need to put A into the decoder state or registers. Then we have A, B, C, isn't that nice? So let's put the larger, the larger variables first, the larger data members. Um, the A register and then we can make a function that will be called renorm D. We do this stuff. So almost everything is already in the decoder except for A. And actually for functions I always put the praise on its own line. I also should do it here. Renorm D. This will also be done here. Okay, so now for the MPS exchange. This is another funny thing that we have to do. But this will hopefully be very similar to the LPS exchange. I think it is. So let's copy this, risking a lot of copy and paste errors, but we will try to be very exact. Um, I think this is maybe a time where we should have a side-by-side -side windows. So 
if it is not smaller, Okay, now they are reversed. Is this true? <clears throat> so if it is smaller, we have D, but this we do not have. Also not here. So if it is smaller, yes, then we flip the <coughs> NPS. If we have a switching activity, then yeah, then we flip it and we go to the NLPS state. Otherwise, D equals NPS and we go to NPS. Yeah, that's it. So the difference is just the branches are flipped and we do not assign to A, which actually, actually the A is decoder.A now. Okay, so what what happens if, on the other hand, so that was the MPS exchange, but on the other hand, if it's still correct, okay, then that, this should actually be the hottest path that happens most often, where we just have, okay, it's it's correct, it's the most the most probable symbol, and no change necessary. And I think we should now have the D. That sounds funny. Um, I think I did not yet define it. And the D is our decoded bit so let's print it hooray we decoded a single bit from all of this mess and immediately afterwards we fail an assertion but that is by design People on this channel, we fail by design. <clears throat> so let's look at all our syntax errors. Sorry. Okay, that's not too many syntax errors. Ah, okay. One thing is error handling. I did not care about error handling at all so far. That's not good because we need... I have my own conventions here for error handling, which may look a bit strange, but uh, I will not explain them now because we don't have the time. I think I talked about it a bit in previous streams. So that's important. These, these functions, they can actually fail because they read something from the data stream and that in turn, that in turn 
can fail. So we need to do error handling here. The renorm also fetches some data. And that's the first thing. Ah, of course, <clears throat> I was acting as if I had references, but I don't use references because I do not like them. I think they were a mistake. I actually would like the dot syntax, but I would like the dot syntax for pointers like John Blow did in his new language. That is something I would like. Okay, what do we have here? Argument three. One address taken too many. Um, yeah, because we actually need to do some error handling here. This is something that I, I plan to do automatic code analysis for, to check against this kind of stuff. Um, okay, because this is actually an array. And so is this. I think my CPU is dying. What is happening? No, no, it's better. It's so hot. It does not... Because it takes... More than that. It takes SD... S... Well, I think like this. Okay, this is in the coder. It compiles. Will we get a single bit? Ray, we decoded a single bit from all of this mess. D equals zero. And I guess we have a baseline chance of 50% to be right about that, right? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, at all be surprised if this is false. Or wrong, I should say. Because I'm not sure about is the initialization. This is something I need to look up. The question is just where is this in the spec? It is for, for sure somewhere.
Where do they describe the initialization? The contexts. I know that somewhere there is a description of how to how to initialize the contexts. There is so much more to do in this download. Scary. We set the arithmetic coding statistics for all the contents of all other goes to zero point five. So that would be That would be a strong hint that this this is actually all right what we did here to set the state and the MPS to zero. So let's look if the if this is actually correct that we get we get the zero. The zero should be the sign bit of the value that we that we decode. The problem is um, this will not be very directly explained here probably. It just says it's the same it's the same symbols. So delta, yeah, it should be it should be a positive number for sure because because what we should get now is actually the the height of the first the height of the first um, height class. And this should definitely have a positive sign. But what we will definitely need to do is to refactor things further. Uh, to actually turn all of this decoding stuff that we did now into a function that gives us a single bit. How should we call this function? function? Let's see. Um, That was the decode function, I think. The decode function. So I think starting here, the decode function starts. <clears throat> so let's turn this stuff into a function. This will be a function 
um, yeah, it will have the same, always the same signature. And this function will give the D. Which is the decoded bit. So I think we can move our tables inside this function, which is already a nice thing. <clears throat> so a more C++ style would would be to put them in an anonymous namespace, probably, or something like that. But actually, this is even more local. So if we can do that, I would be fine with that. <clears throat> okay, now we have the next problem. that so all the branches should assign to D at some point. They do for sure. This one does, this one does, this one does, yeah. So D is assigned to on all branches. Actually a compiler should bonus if it isn't, I think. I hope these warnings are enabled. Um, yeah, then we will need to put the context into a structure, I think. And the context will have these two things that we zero at the beginning. These two things will be in the context. And the decode thing will actually need the context. So state will become context state. And MPS will become context MPS, which is a bit ugly because this is used a lot. This is maybe one point where more C++ style with implicit this pointer would be a slight advantage, but I don't care too much about that. And I have reasons to do otherwise, as you can read on my description panels. So, where are we?
we are here. Da, da, da. SDS bits, decoder, and context. And we do check errors. Let's see if this still gives us, after some syntax errors, if this still gives us the D equals zero. Yeah, again, I forgot to do the stupid change of dots to The change of the dots to the arrows, the most frequent refactoring change that you have to do in C and C++. So it's not happy about, ah, yeah, this is the second most frequent change that you need to do in C and C++. So, have you a chance to compile? No. Context is undeclared because it's an arithmetic context. We compile. And we still get the zero. Now it will be very exciting to see what happens when we actually decode more bits. Should we be very daring and just try a few more? Let's see what we get. <clears throat> I would like as a closure for today's session, I would really love to see the first heat delta correctly decoded from this arithmetic mess. That would be really nice. So we get zero, 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 one, one. Let's write this down. So four zeros and two ones. Um, we need to go to the integer, integer, decoding procedure I H D H they are all decoded the same so S is zero so we have a positive number that's good because I think what do we expect? Do we expect eight? I 
think we expect um, we expect the height of these symbols or six we said one two three four five six six is what we expect so let's go again to integer decoding procedure we decoded s now we decode a bit it is zero So the value is the next two bits. Mm, that's not so good because that can only be zero to three. So S is the first one, that is correct. So we would actually get a zero from the first decoding. Can this be correct? I'm not sure. What would be a six? A six would be a sign of zero. Sign of zero. Then a one probably. Now we are here. Then a zero. And then binary two plus four is six. And that would be more what I expect expect. Um We also have some reference data for the in the standard for the decoder here, but I'm not sure this trace for which if this is for NX age uh, test sequence for arithmetic decoder. Okay, this is something we can actually this is something that we can put in a unit test first. This this is a better starting point for debugging the arithmetic decoder. So let's just do that. Let's export our nice arithmetic stuff here to the header file. So the structs will be here. This will become a prototype. And we will care about speed and inlining and everything else later when things work. Wow, this looks so slow, this code, it has so many so many branches. Okay, 
<coughs> and then we can make ourselves a unit test. Uh, we will zero the context, so context has date and MPS. <clears throat> and then we will need some input, a bit similar to this here. Input will be Ah, I cannot copy because this is a lockdown file. And even though I I paid a lot of my money for this standard, I cannot even copy a freaking thing out of it. This is so stupid. This is digital rights management for you. Okay, we have some input. Then let's put this input into a data stream. Let's make a bit source for it. All the usual stuff. And let's decode some bits. Let us decode. Oh yeah, we need the decoder. Decoder, we, we probably will need an init function for the... <laughs> Let's check that it didn't fail. For now, let's just print it. We will later do a proper self-checking test. Um, we will need to initialize the decoder. This is something we will also need to refactor into a function. So this stuff here, we will say some, something like, the standard is called init deck, that's a very short name. Hmm.
could call it something like this. Let's first put it somewhere. I will actually need to delete this here because we have this in the header now. Um, in it, coder. It's could it be we have all of the stuff. This is the usual things that we, yeah, we again have our favorite. Our favorite substitutions that thank God Vim tends to remember. Uh, we need a failed path like here. And we need to call this here, of course. Bits are not a pointer here, the code, of course, are not. And error check. And this um, Do we already use the namespace or not? I'm not sure. In the unit test, we will do something similar. But here, the status, this is, these are all objects. And this we don't do in the unit test. We assert that there was no problem. It is getting late. So I hope we will soon see some reasonable results here. Ah, we need to put this in the header, of course. This is another funny thing in C++ that we always have to double everything up. Because you have these wonderful headers. We compile. And the good thing is now we almost compile. Because of course we again have these our most favorite substitutions. Always back and forth. I'm really getting close to always even if I have destructs on a stack or something to always declare a pointer to stuff and get over it and always use the arrow because it's so annoying to change it back and forth. And again, Visual Studio is thinking for hours. How can you write software that is so slow? It's amazing.
this software project currently has literally only a few thousand lines. How can you analyze a few thousand lines for half a minute or so? What do you do all the time? It's, it's just completely crazy. Okay, um, did we actually not get to our test? I think I think we did not get to a test. Which I don't fully understand because normally that's what we do. And let's try to run this test directly. Uh, do we get some output, please? So, zero, 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 zero. Can this be right? Yeah, it could even be right. So we need to decode more to see uh, 32 bytes we need to decode. So this will be 32 times 8. And then we need something like a bit counter. Um, a byte counter probably. Right. Um, so then <clears throat> it's probably starting with the MSB, I guess. So let's always all this into byte. Byte is first shifted left by one. And then if plus plus n bits equals 8 then we have a full byte so we print it uh, we reset it to zero we increment so if plus plus n bytes ik modulo how many do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Sixteen. Let us try this. Does it do something? It's thinking and thinking and thinking. Not compiling anything, it seems. I would really like to know what it is doing in this time. Without any output. Visual Studio, my patience is ending. What are you analyzing all the time? I really need to get out of this IDE. I only started using it recently when I started this project. 
<clears throat> and it's already getting unbearable. I really ne need to set up things for the command line. Okay, why do we get only a single byte? Ah, because we never reset the bits. That's why. Okay, it seems to think now every time forever. So zero two zero fifty one should we should get this. Really curious what is going on here. So let's spy a bit on the processes. Um, I'm getting blind. Okay, this the compiler is running, but what is it compiling? Don't see any command line. Ah, maybe we should be administrator. Let me see that. I always forget that. <coughs> okay, now it's gone. So it probably did something. Unfortunately, I mean, we, we see the zero and we see the two, but then, then we have a mistake, it seems. So we will need to do more tracing here. But that should not be a big problem. Um, so let's for now do a new one here and we always print, we always print a trace. Uh, we have the state, the D, the I. What is the I? The I? No, the I is the state. I don't know what the what this is. MPS, we know what it is. Uh, C. What is C E? I have no idea. QE we know. A we know. C we know. CT we do. And this should also be So, okay, let's for now, let's log these. So the first one we do not know. 
second one we know then we have the context state we called it context mps uh, the QE, this is actually, okay, this, uh, we do not have this right now because this is a function of the state which that we do not export. Um, this is decoder.a, decoder.c, decoder.ct and something. So the question is, is there any way to get a faster compile here? That's insane. What is this thing doing? This is just a normal compiler call. Why is this compiler taking forever? That is so crappy. Now that I want to come to a close and want to know if my software works, the compiler stops working. So blah, 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 I need to test. Let's see if this has bears some semblance to what we should get. We go to state one, that is correct. AC02, that is also correct. Oh, but there's something wrong with our C. <laughs> and our CT, these, these look very wrong. Very, very wrong. Why do they look so wrong? Let's also print the state after initialization to see if we already have the problem there. So we don't have a D here. The other stuff we should have. Wow, I really need to fix this. <laughs> no background tasks are running, but it's still taking forever.
this is compiling a really small file what it's doing um, let's use the time to think about what could it be the problem here have i messed up the printf all of them should be integer promoted here so there should be no problem with the x and the u's Okay, so we already have a problem at the beginning, which is kind of what I expected. Uh, it could be the byte in messing things up. And now we, are, we should probably step through it. Mm, can I not debug this one? Debug. Okay. Let's look at our decoder. Yeah, it has the typical the poisoning values from the stack that is to be expected. Okay, that's actually, it's not a problem. Is this a problem? Ah, sorry, I looked at the wrong, I should look here at the decoder. Four, two is correct, but then we are, four, two is correct. But we are missing the rest. Six, three, eight. Six, three, eight. Is this directly from the screen? C. So yeah, six three. This if you divide by two, you get six three. So this is directly stream data. We have two little stream data at the beginning in our C. Um, so we need we need actually, I think, three bytes of stream data as initialization. Oh, 
Oh, <laughs> we are missing the S path in byte in. That's something. We are missing a path. This one here, people. Why are we missing? Did I miss this when I copied stuff? Where did this? Because I think well, maybe I did not really write this, but I thought I I did this. Because it should be something like this that we the last byte was not this. So we, we read the new one. And we do something a bit similar to this, but with eight and eight. Something is really going downhill on this machine. But I want to know, do we decode correctly? I need to know. I need to know it. That looks good. That looks good. People, I think we get some correct data out of this thing after all. Yeah, this looks good. This is looking good. So I think we can get rid of some of the debug for now. Sorry. Let's use the time to make some comparisons here. So, 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 so. this looks all good. So the A is crucial. Yes, these are all the right A values. That is great. And the C, the C also looks good. I think our code is working. What is not working is Microsoft code. Because people at Microsoft do not know how to program. It seems. So I 
I'm still not sure about what we get here. But I think for now, for now, this is, and let's run this again so we get a better view of the, of the bytes. We have a non-working Visual Studio, but we have a working arithmetic decoder, I think. At least uh, the innermost core of the arithmetic decoder. The actual arithmetic decoding. Around that, next time we will build the integer arithmetic decoder, which actually will be boring work, I think, compared to what we did today. And then we need to get all this context handling set up and so on. This does not seem to reload. So it's beautiful. Let us compare. 0, 2, 0, 51, 0, 0, 0, 0, 3, 52. This looks so good. We get all the correct bits. We have 80, 90. Even at the end, where we do probably the stuffing with one bits. That is great. So this only needs to be, I just need to make a note that I do not forget. So I will put an assert force here so I do not forget and turn this into a proper test. I will not do that today because I am too tired people. And with that, I thank you for watching. If there is anybody still here who has made it to this point, um, let's take a final look at our code. Where does it start? The namespace arithmetic. <clears throat> we have a working arithmetic decoder that is slow as hell probably, but it's working. And that was the goal for today. Quite complicated for getting a few bits. I hope this can be simplified a bit. But let's see how many lines is this already. One hundred fifty six lines. Yeah. What can you say? Okay. Then according to Twitch, I have some viewers left. That is so great. So thanks for watching and I hope to see you next time when we will proceed with the integer arithmetic encoding. So see you next time. Bye.